Hi everybody, welcome to the Sharon Ballantyne Show. I am your host, Sharon Ballantyne, Law of Attraction Life Coach and Parenting Coach. Today I have a very special guest with me, Robbie Firestone. Robbie is a world-class portrait artist. She creates spirit capture portraits focused deeply on one's inner as well as outer beauty. Her commissions include Grammy winner Kebmo, Michael Murphy, co-founder of Esalen Institute, and Bart Millard of best-selling Mercy Me. And we're going to talk about Robbie's projects and, and lots of great things about her today. Welcome, Robbie. Hello, my love. How are you? <laughs> I'm great, gorgeous. How are you? I'm so happy so good. That, we, that we're doing this. We've talked about it for a long time, haven't we? We've, this I has know. been in the works for many months. So yay. It has. <laughs> Coordinating your schedule and mine. Ugh. Crazy. Oh. And behind you, I love that we're looking at your art, your brand new studio in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Yes, I'm so excited. And I know how hard you've worked at it. It looks beautiful, oh, absolutely fantastic. You. So congratulations thank you. Thank on your you new so studio. Much. Thank so you. So you're doing well today. We're happy you're here. And mm -hmm. we want to hear about you. We want to hear about your passions, how you started way back in your in your mm -hmm. you know divine life path and life and what got you to this point where you are now creating what you are currently creating well so let's start well, there okay um, I am a practitioner through science of mind or, or Michael Beckwith's agape in, in uh, and I've always in Los Angeles and I've always been passionate about Compar learning comparative religions, not just academically, but experientially. So I take classes in existential existentialism to Buddhist meditation. And through one of these courses, um, I was painting and ended up writing this intuitive reading into each of the pieces. And um, that became all of a sudden my business. So the great life lesson I got from that is do what you love and somehow life just shifts it all in place for us. Very and true. That's how I started. Okay, yeah. so absolutely. So when did this happen for you? When did you have this this awakening that where you knew you were going to be an artist, where that was started to come through you? Well, I think I've been an artist since I was a young girl. Mm -hmm. I was I remember sleepless nights um, at my drafting table drawing always portraits, faces. I found a, a sketchbook from high school, flipped it open and saw this little boy that I used to babysit, Felix, and it just leapt off the page. It was so him. I'll have to show it to you sometime. It's, I'd love to see it. Yeah, it's really kind of demonstrative that I was always fascinated with people's eyes and and looking into people's eyes and then it just through life taking different career paths, different jobs, different experiences found portrait painting again and then combine the elements to create what I create create now these spirit capture portraits and and being brazen enough I say I have rhino skin. To be able to do portrait commissions is a completely different beast. It really is. Well, mm -hmm. Robbie, I've always seen you as a warrior. You are mm. you're fierce and you're strong and you're independent. In lace. <laughs> and feminine. Don't let me forget feminine and beautiful. Thank but you. you know, it took it took time in your life and it took process. Yes. To to bring all of those characteristics out in you. Yes. And so can you take us back to an earlier point in your life when you mm -hmm. weren't living the divine dream of, of the portrait artist, you know, oh. when you were doing other things, when you were expressing art in a different form. And I know that you've expressed this spirit within you mm -hmm. in many ways over your whole life. And I know sometimes it was exactly what you wanted to be living and other times maybe it wasn't. Can you share with our viewers some of those amazing teaching moments on how you how you created and how you overcame and, and what your process was like? 
Well, I was raised in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, this small farm community in the middle of nowhere at the time. And, um, and I just had this profound need to move to New York City to be an actress. Because <laughs> I was always doing, in, in high school, I was doing drama as well as drawing. And so I moved to New York um, and ended up being an actress and going to design school, Parsons School of Design, but um, foregoing all of my scholarships and the like to this beautiful liberal arts college that I, that I had full ride to. And so I've made incredibly... Oh, I'm thinking of a Sharon word. <laughs> For, I've made some really, really questionable decisions in the beginning. Um, I, I had so much self-doubt, and I thought life had to be hard, really, really mm -hmm. hard. And when I was going to school, um, I was a sophomore the first year of my college year because I tested out of a lot of things. And, and, um, and I remember college was just easy. I was straight A, I was on a homecoming court, and, you know, my first year, and I just, I didn't understand that life could be grace, and I thought that it had to be a fight, and so by eliminating this great opportunity for myself and moving to New York prematurely, I threw myself into some profoundly difficult situations. So what, what happened in your life or who, who was the influence that, that helped you believe that life had to be hard? Where did that come mm. from? Because I know a lot of people struggle with that. It, you know, it, a lot of people do. You know, I think for me it was my it was it was an element of many things. My father, who's an incredible man, was born in nineteen thirty two, but he was a, an orphan and raised in the depression and and um, it lived in a slat wooden house you know where during the winter in blizzard Missouri um, mm -hmm. you could see the sun shining between the slats and a dirt floor and you know he had it really hard and and he did his best to prepare us for life being hard and so okay. he could be strong and um, and so it was my monologue, it was my internal monologue. Also the particular Catholic parish I grew up in taught that we were supposed to sacrifice in order for God to love us. And so there were a lot of cultural, religious, um, different elements that made me who I am and I'm incredibly grateful. I love my dad, he's a king, he's so beautiful. And I love that I was raised Catholic, even though that's my not my choice now. And I needed to create new monologues in my head, new teachings. Yes. Didn't you find, so how did those not serve you? What were you creating in your life that, that helped you see that, you know, maybe it wasn't working out very well to have huh. the belief that life should be hard, right? <laughs> yeah, well, you're my greatest teacher of that, too. I talk about you all the time. Thank you, Robbie. Um, and you're really good at this, by the way. You're wonderful at this interviewing thing. I keep wanting to look at you instead of the camera. You're so beautiful. Anyway, okay, the question. Focus. What, what did you create that that was you're so cute? What did you create that was difficult? That was a wake up call, maybe. That wow, life is hard, but maybe I don't have to keep creating this because it doesn't feel very good. Well, I was in New York City for 13 years and and lived in squalor, oh. <laughs> just really dreadful um, situations and. And then I ended up getting married. Um, that didn't work out so well. And just these pieces of my life that I'd chosen and I had built were profoundly harmful and painful. And um, and I came to um, the moment of decision: Did I want to live this life anymore? Or did I not? And I was. Uh, oh. This is a very profound moment for me where mm -hmm. I remember looking out a window at a wire that was completely caked in ice, just caked in ice, a telephone wire, gray sky behind it. And these five birds, blackbirds, came and landed on the ice. 
they looked like a haiku. It was this extraordinarily beautiful moment. And I'm sitting there completely depressed, looking out my window. And all of a sudden, one of the birds alighted. And all of the glass, I mean, all of the ice that looks like glass shattered and just, wow. and it fell to the <laughs> ground. And I remember thinking at that moment, I am frozen. I am frozen inside. I am dead. I, there's nothing left of this life. So the question is, do I really want to take it seriously, this till death do us part? Mm -hmm. Or do I want to know that I'm spiritually dead and move on? And so that was a huge realization, and I hopped on a plane with nothing and moved to Los Angeles to just escape my life. Right. And then I found Agape, spiritual center, International Spiritual Center with Michael Beckwith, who I'm actually doing, uh, he's in a project I'm doing. And he became my new great teacher. You know, he, mm -hmm. and, that, and that community, that spiritual community that was so full of different viewpoints and ideas and it, it gave me options and it showed me that the way I was thinking could be changed. That's beautiful and I just want to back up for a moment you know to really help the viewers see the the teaching moment here you know mm -hmm. the, the choices so mm -hmm. you were you were at a dead end you were at a place where you were you were seeing if you had any options and it was yes. a very true defining moment and I love how Mother Nature mm -hmm so often steps in mm -hmm. in that way and yeah. you you were open enough to be able to see that to be able to to feel that mm -hmm. and know that you had a, a new choice and even if it even if you hadn't turned your life around in that moment and you were just escaping that was still a choice that was still movement wasn't it, it that it was, was velocity still, yeah m movement of energy yes. to give exactly. you the opportunity to find something new yes so no, so I, I really want to just acknowledge you for that because it, it's really no matter where we are in our life, you know, that moment if we're if we're awake enough or at all mm -hmm. to hear those messages and to be looking around before it becomes, you know, where we can't repair it, where we, we can't make a new choice. And and I think really that only comes with death because we can always choose something different. So yeah. You went on and you were looking for more, right? You were looking. You yes. didn't know what it would be, but no. you were open to finding something new. And you did, and you found mm -hmm. something beautiful. I did. I knew I had to change. And the, and the two things that I find have always been my teachers are nature and other people. I, I look at the person before me, and I ask myself, is this person enriching my life? Is this person supporting my vision? Is this person believing in what I truly want? And if they do, then I spend more time with them right. and I ask yeah. them uh, about their philosophies. And if they don't, I love them and I keep my, my innermost thoughts to myself. You know, there's a biblical passage, don't throw your pearls before swine. And it's really guided me so much because I don't think it's about pearls or swine necessarily, right. but no. I am this incredibly fragile, beautiful pearl, and I'm not going to give it to someone who isn't go who's going to toss it in the mud and trample it. I'm going to hold myself yeah. genuinely as precious and give myself to people like you who look into the world as precious and, and support visions for others. Well, you've become very good at listening to your own inner guidance, your own internal guidance system, right? And and that tells us by how we're feeling and you use it so intensely in <laughs> how you feel when you're before someone else, you know, do they feel good to me? Do they support me? You ask yourself those very important questions, very powerful yes. questions that um, often people forget to ask themselves. They they aren't being present in their moment or their internal self yes. to really look at that. And then time is wasted, isn't it? And we've all done that, yes. of course, at one point or another. We spend mm -hmm. time with people that don't feel good, that don't serve us. So, Yes, yes, exactly. And, you know, family of origin is so applicable there mm -hmm. because, um, you know, we're, we're taught that we have to, to hold on to, to friendships and hold on to 
to family. And, and I think it's about holding on less tight, you know, less tightly. It's like I can hold on and I love, love, love my family, and yet there are certain members that I choose to not spend time with because they don't um, enrich my experience. And until they're open to enriching my experience as well as their own um, in relationship, yeah. I can't participate. You know? Yes, I agree. On that with level. It, it's funny in, in our culture. Well, they're family, so we have to. They're family, so we have yeah. to. But really, that's just a limiting belief because they're still human beings, and we really don't have to if they don't feel good. And mm -hmm. I hear that over and over from from people and clients that that mm -hmm. feel that they need to be in those relationships only. The only criteria being that they're family, and that just perpetuates what you were talking about, which is you know creating what you don't want and and having people around you that don't feel good. Yeah, and the amazing. And it's hard to do. It's not easy to do, but. It has yes. to be done right for... It's so true. It's yeah. really about diligence. And mm -hmm. and the interesting thing is, as I've had challenges with particular family members, and I've stepped away, most of us have grown together. And really, um, it's exciting to me, because I have whole new relationships. And yet, there's one particular member of the family that I you know, didn't invite to my wedding, and I'm not interested in, in participating with. So, it's... Anyway, it's just... It's, it's all about just, just living what feels good. That's really the bottom line here, right? And, and sometimes it includes family, and, and sometimes it doesn't. And yeah. live our, to live our highest life, mm -hmm. that is... And, and I think feeling good is also... We have to really focus on that being a very deep feeling good, because mm -hmm. being comfortable is very different. You know, I have... I jump out of airplanes and bungee and I scuba dive with great white sharks and I, I bet your woman mm -hmm. <laughs> I do I love it that scare the pants off of me right. the, and it's incredibly uncomfortable I mean I will never forget the moment of throwing my body out of an airplane at 12,500 feet it was uncomfortable and it didn't feel good at all and yet I knew that it was an obstacle that I needed to push through and it was uncomfortable and I was focused on seeing myself on the other side of that relationship with myself. So I just want to, I want you to, if, if you would, speak about that difference between feeling comfortable and feeling good, do you know, in terms of relationship. Because well, I think you've got that <laughs> down. <laughs> practice, practice and creation and relationship relationship yes I I've, mm -hmm. I've gotten really good at it but it's all as in anything mm -hmm. in life a complete process and I think it's it's really boils down to how will how willing are we individually mm -hmm. you know willing to to have comfortable or have it ecstatic and I think mm, that we wow. we that's beautiful I think, I think we settle for comfortable but we create ecstatic and oh. I know that I want to quote that. <laughs> I'm going to put that in my Facebook. Well, I know that from experience with with my relationships, with all of them, and I and I had to learn the hard way. I had all the attachments and the needs and all those things in the past that didn't feel good. You know, I yeah. created the my husband and I co-created our relationship from the ashes, if you will, and oh. we created a work of art, and yeah. that comes by being fully present. It comes with being deliberate. It comes with having the intention mm -hmm. of having it ecstatic. Believe me, it's never an accident. And I think mm -hmm. all of us know that from life experience, right? It's yeah. not, not an accident to have that. You have to work at it and have the intention. But if the work doesn't feel good, then you're not going about it in the way that's going to serve you. It has to feel good. It has to feel fun. You have to yeah. want to do it. And it has to be easy. Mm -hmm. And then, see, that's a different type of work than yeah. pound the pavement work. That's yes. the kind of work that flows. That's the kind of work that helps you create exactly what you want. Well, and it's interesting because I just recently had a show in Santa Fe, a gallery show. Yes. And, and it was very, very successful. And um, I was waking up at 3 and 5 o'clock every morning mm -hmm. to spend six to eight hours in my office and then have a little bit of time off in the middle of the day and then go work in my studio. 
And it, there were very long days, and, and I still filled the middle of the day with beautiful lunches with friends and that sort of thing to fill me full. And yet I worked like a warrior. I mean, I yes. worked so diligently mm. and so hard. It wasn't that wasn't easy per se, and yet the outcome was so glorious and so exciting. And we got press in the Miami Herald and Boston Globe and San Francisco Chronicle at Gate and Dallas and Oklahoma. And, yes. you know, and if I hadn't mm -hmm. done all of that diligent work, I never would have had that kind of outcome. No. So that's the balance for me is always learning, okay, where is the doing and where is the manifesting and how do I stand in that dance between working to the best of my ability, striving for the exemplary and putting everything I am into what I want and believe in and grace, <laughs> you know? And the ease and flow, absolutely. Can I address mm -hmm. that? Please. Because that's a great one. It's all about inspired action. Inspired mm -hmm. action. So you can take all of that yes. hard work and you can take the long hours, but mm -hmm. you need to be having fun at that toil in order yes. to achieve the grace. If yes. it doesn't feel good and you feel like you're just um, pounding your head, Mm -hmm. I promise you, you're getting nowhere. So you can put the long hours and the inspired action. Yes. You're able to hear your inspired action when you're in a place of feeling good and mm -hmm. having fun. Yeah. So when that's, let's say you put in a few hours and all of a sudden it starts to not feel good. It starts to feel overwhelming or your yes. you know, head clouds up, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Stop. Stop yes. right there. Don't push through. Stop mm -hmm. and take a short break and get back to that place of feeling inspired and feeling good and then go right back at it. I promise you it'll be more more productive and you'll have mm -hmm. all of your inspired gifts back. Mm -hmm. I love that. Inspired action. That's wonderful. Thank you. To get us to where we want to be. So I want to talk about your art. I want to talk about those amazing paintings behind mm -hmm. you. And you are a commission portrait artist. So yes. people ask you to paint their portrait or their child's mm -hmm. portrait or anyone that they know and love. Yes. So please share that process with us. And I, please let me say that I have been one of those very, very fortunate people to have one of your commissions. Mm -hmm. And I love it. It's really, mm -hmm. I really truly love it. And we had so much fun doing the process. So it's not yeah. just about the work of art that we receive at, mm -hmm. at the end. It's about the process. And the yes. process is beautiful for the client. And I know it is for you too. So mm -hmm. please walk us through what that looks like from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Happy to. Thank you for asking. And if anyone wants to know, I just posted, I just tagged Sharon, her portrait, and her, her lovely face by her portrait at Sharon Valentine Facebook, and then mine as well, Robbie Firestone, or BBI. But, so if you want to see the picture, it's there. Um, so the process is I really get to know someone. Generally, it's not a stranger I'm painting. It's someone who is really invested in learning about what I do and feeling called to do what I do. So they study my website, RobbieFirestone.com or PortraitCommission.net. And, um, and they get to know my work. They get to know my philosophy. Generally, um, I do a sitting for about a day where I'm asking someone to bring a sacred object that they um, they can tell me why it's really important to them, why it's sacred, and that kind of opens a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I ask them about their highest passions and their 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 obstacles that they've not moved through or what they have moved through. I ask them about their possibilities um, and what their vision for their life is. And I paint from that place. So I'm not painting the person sitting in front of me at this moment in time. I'm painting from this place of vision where I really believe in the divinity of each human. And so I feel I'm painting from that place of where they connect with their divine. And so it takes me um, 
generally six months to a year to finish a piece and present it. I love to do unveiling parties where people gather all their loved ones and their friends together and we unveil in front of their loved ones. <laughs> it's what we did with you, which was fun. Yeah. And um, because it's, it's kind of an ecstatic experience. It's surprising and kind of shocking um, to see yourself painted. And yet, it's it also is. It is. really juicy and good. And that's that's the process. And a vulnerability, you know, for, mm -hmm. for us to sit before you and open up our hearts yeah. to you. Mm -hmm. Because you do paint from that, that deeper place. And, and yeah. I really felt it when you were painting me. You were painting from my heart out mm -hmm. rather than oh. just my exterior. I love that. You know, it's interesting to me because we've all heard or there. there's a meditative practice um, in Buddhism that's walking meditation. Mm -hmm. So literally you might see um, a monk with a chime and he's literally walking step by step. And it's about completely being in body and in spirit. And the, the, the totally present moment. And, and I really look at my paintings as a painting meditation. So I do my best to do that, to be in this place of non-judgment. And I say that in front of my easel, I have a sacred space. And if I find the critic or the judge stepping in, oh, bad red, or ugh, that stroke wasn't good, I step away and I go sit down and I get connected again. And then I begin, I resume painting. Exactly. And the process is, Sometimes, I mean, for a time we sit in front of you and we mm -hmm. talk to you and you and you paint the outline and you fill in some of the blanks, you mm -hmm. take photographs, and then really most of the time spent with the painting, we are not present. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that would be maddening <laughs> for me. <laughs> yeah, six months to a year. <laughs> well, and, and you. You know, I there are moments that. when when I walk away from the piece at night because I don't like it and think it, she's not there yet. She's Where is she? And I'm asking the paint, you know, it's interesting. I don't feel I'm actually, there's this part of me that doesn't feel I'm applying paint to a canvas. I feel like I'm carving Sharon out of the canvas yeah. with color and I don't know how to explain that. It's just the way my brain works. And so I, I keep like, where is she? Where is she? Where Where is she? And then finally there's a moment where the eyes mm -hmm. look at me. And I say, oh, wow. Oh, she's there. Thank I've God. Got, I've got her. Say, and it is always like, oh, thank God. I didn't think I would yeah. get to this moment. Oh, my gosh. But, yeah, but I always do. It's so I always get there. And, and, and I very rarely redo a painting. I think in the history of my career, I've probably stopped on one canvas and restarted because I feel that initial time that I spend with you in your home or yeah. actually now in my studio mm -hmm. it's it's like your energy is imbued in the canvas and I really want to honor that and want to right that yes. canvas. Yes, so. and you take the, and you take that with you to finish that process. Yes. So Robbie, you know, peop, the viewers can't see from here but on your canvases in the back mm -hmm. very subtly but still very visible are the most beautiful words. Mm -hmm. your, your spirit capture writings, mm -hmm. you know, please tell us about that and, and what it, how in, it's individual to each portrait and how that comes through you because that is a very integral, important part of what we receive from you is that yeah. spirit capture writing. What do you call it? I'm not... I call it the book. spirit capture letter. Letter. And I, ha I yes. have my book. Yes. It's kind of, here's a sort of a little close up. Okay. But um, beautiful. But it's it's just basically a letter that I write from my deepest heart to yours. Mm -hmm. So as I, I write it in one sitting at some point during the painting process, there's just this intuitive hit that comes through me and I just start writing. Wow. And I don't redo, I don't cross out, I don't edit. I literally say, okay, this is what is meant to come through. And it's, it starts with the beauty I see in you, Sharon Valentine. And then I go through the magnificence of who you are, the, the, the wonderful beauty I see in you. Um, 
the love that you gift to your community, the the things I admire about you, and what what I feel, why I feel you're on the planet to, as a as a presence of, of God, as, as a right. facet yeah. of the divine, and. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I realized early on was we don't compliment each other enough. We don't love each other enough with our words. You know, as a community, as a culture, at least in the mid Midwest where I grew up, mm -hmm. you know, people are very open about criticizing one another, but just turning to one another and saying, you are so beautiful, and I love you so much. I know. It you is. know, it's yeah. just, it's so easy to do. Even I was at a gallery opening, um, last weekend, and there was this woman who was so striking. I mean, her eyes, her, she just, she was not just physically beautiful, she had gorgeous silver hair and green eyes, and she was strong, and, you know, like warrior strong. And I just walked up to her and I said, you are such a beautiful woman. And she kind of was taken aback. And we ended up having a lovely conversation, and and she's a lawyer, and she's very into philanthropy, and she's well. She's, it's such a gift. It's such a gift uh, when when you give that to someone because you benefit, and you've given them a gift. And I it is that. it's beautiful. And the letter that you write, you you hand it to each of us in an envelope, and yes. and it subtly on the canvas of our mm -hmm. portraits as well. Yes, which is beautiful. It's just it is. It's it's half the fun. Was <laughs> it is actually half that one letter right here. because it's very long and detailed and and it just from the heart. I know it made me cry. I know it here's, made me cry. Here's a, is that, a an example of one. This is just a terrible yes. kind of one I did for myself, but it's really kind I know, of there, it's beautiful. It's the so if someone is up there, they can sort of read part of it, and it's just kind of a hint and a tease. Yes, but it's beautiful. So yeah. the intention is for you to be able to keep it forever, and if you're ever having a bad day, you can look at this this letter and yeah. think, yeah. this woman doesn't know me, and yet she saw these incredible things about me. Mm -hmm. I yeah. must be really wonderful. You know, they're they are life affirming, and they make us feel good. And mm -hmm. I know it's it's really an important part of your process. To do it that, is. to channel that, so yeah, so it really any, is. Anyone that's lucky enough to have, you know, your, and I encourage everyone to have <laughs> a, a Robbie Firestone portrait. But you know, as we're moving through the show, I don't want to lose sight of that you have projects going. I, I really want to talk about your amazing pro project, your 12 global visionaries in 12 months. You yes. came up with that. I remember when you did. So, <laughs> Let's, yeah. Please tell the viewers what that is, what it means, why you're doing it, and where are you mm -hmm. in the process. Well, 12 Global Visionaries in 12 Months was a concept that I, I have my heroes and heroines, mm -hmm. and, and people I love who are my great teachers, and, and, and using their lives, literally using their life as a tool to make the world a better place. Like Deepak Chopra, like Marianne Williamson, like God bless him, Nelson, Nelson Mandela. And so I had this idea one morning, it just downloaded from Spirit, oh, you need to do this project. So mm. I sort of put my feelers out and um, the idea is that I wanted to, sh to, to paint 12 global visionaries in 12 months, I want it to. I will have it show at the United Nations, and then each of the pieces will respectively travel, go on tour mm -hmm. to perhaps United States embassies around the world, and then be auctioned off to benefit philanthropic causes of subjects. So I sat with Michael Beckwith for about five hours in his office. Um, He's How the, fun is that? Oh know? my gosh, it was extraordinary. It was an extraordinary moment in my life to, to have that gift of his presence too. But he um, he sat with me. He's he's from The Secret, um, one of the main yeah. guys in The Secret. And then Mary Ann Williamson, I saw her at a, a gathering and, and she said she would do it, although now she's running for Congress, so I've not been able to book time with her yet. And I have someone, I will, thank you. Someone speaking to Deepak, someone speaking to um, uh, Don Miguel Ruiz. Oh, right, of course. The four agreements. 
The four agreements. The four agreements. Fabulous. So those those are the starts, you know, and it's taking longer than twelve months because getting time with these people is, yes. you know, significant. Um, that's and great. that's my vision. And so, yeah, do you have your twelve? Do you have I, all twelve? I don't have the twelve. Okay. Committed. I have the twelve in my mind. Oh, you do. Um, okay. All right. And great. and then I have friends who are, who, and and sort of associates who are farming, you know, going, well, what about this person, and what about this person? So it's also giving me great new content in terms of, oh, I don't know that person. I'll try that, you know, see who that is and if it resonates with me. And so you're booking time with them. You're going to be painting their portraits. And how do you have any of the portraits completed? No, I don't. No. You know, I, th I think what I'm going to do is book the time with the people and then literally paint them all in 12 months. So even though the bookings are taking a while, I really want to keep the integrity of that 12 Global Visionaries in 12 months, and I don't know why. Maybe I need to look up the numerology of 12. But um, it just feels like the paintings all want to come together at once. That's fantastic. And to be in that place of, of you know being inspired like that, it does mm -hmm. make sense yeah. to do it all just while you're in that while you're in that space. And, and, Robin, then, and I might change that too because I'm sitting here looking at the photograph of Michael Beckwith and I and going, you know, I can see his painting. It's like a lion, you know, coming together. So I'm like, maybe I will start. We'll see. Well, you get to choose your timing and that's the wonderful thing is you get to choose. It's yeah. all up to you. So really I encourage you to do whatever feels exactly. good and is comfortable mm -hmm. and not have any timelines that, that don't feel good. Exactly. When the muse visits, I will abide. <laughs> One of the things I've always admired about you is your sense of philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And I know it's been always been an important part of your life. You know, you donate a, pros, a portion of each of your, you know, portrait commissions and you're mm -hmm. talking about the philanthropy in this project. Can you tell us how that started within you and what drives you? And, and who do you love to support? Well, um, I grew up in a very giving family. Uh, my parents were uh, foster parents, and so we had six foster children over the course of about eight years living with our family, mm -hmm. taking care of these abused and neglected babies. And um, we didn't have money to give necessarily to charities, but um, I look at what I do as the ability to leverage, um, leverage good. You know, I, I'm always about how can I make the best good happen. Even in my gallery show recently, usually it's just a gallery show, Spirit of Santa Fe, and what I did was I committed to giving 3% um, to the fooddepot.org, the fooddepot.org, which feeds families all around New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say, well, why aren't you supporting arts organizations? And I remember a time in my life when I lived in New York that I was physically hungry. I was malnourished. I was mm -hmm. I was um, living a very, very meager life. And there was no room for self-fulfillment or self-actualization when you're hungry or when you don't have a roof over your head or you're worried yeah. about your children's safety or a medical problem. And so I feel like feeding people is... I'm very passionate about that. It has to start there, right? If we don't have our yeah. basic needs met, mm -hmm. nothing else really is of importance yeah. to us. Exactly. You know? Exactly. So you live in the art capital of the world, really, one of them, um, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I know you just recently moved there. And how fun for you to live in such an environment that I know feeds your soul. Yeah. So. Is that the reason why you moved to Santa Fe? Why why the timing now to be there? Well, my husband and I actually live between Seattle and Santa Fe. So just to clarify. Yeah. Um, and the reason we chose it was very intuitive. Um, we we had, I've been in Seattle with him for eight years, and it's just very cloudy and rainy there and very hard for me being a California girl. Um, <laughs> right. So... So I said, I need to move, and he said, okay. So we went on a quest for six months uh, where we drove all through the west. We knew we wanted to stay west and just said, let's see what hits us. And we, um, we both have our own businesses, so we were able to pack up our computers and 
I didn't take commissions for a while, so if I needed to, if we needed to go back up for meetings, we would just hop on a plane. But we um, we just journeyed. You know, we we felt a place, and if it felt good, we would stay a night, and if we didn't, we would move on. And and uh, we fell in love with Ojai, California, which is between yeah. LA and Santa Barbara, and. Um, Stayed around there for about four days, and then went. Well, what else is there? Maybe there's this one last place we want to try. We drove into Santa Fe, New Mexico, and just fell in love with the culture, the people, the aesthetics. The light is extraordinary here for an artist. It just I felt something viscerally open that I belong here. Yeah. And so yes. yeah, that's where we are right now. And it's so beautiful, your surroundings, and, and you were available to just find your perfect place. And I love how you always do that so passionately. So passionately. <laughs> I do. I, I to really be, do. I to be a what gifted artist. Well, to be a gifted, a gifted artist, you really have to have a certain openness, right? And I think a certain passion about everything. And, yeah. and I, I know. see that in you. Yeah, something that I find interesting, and I don't know what this is, but um, it is like a warrior-like commitment to a really, really awesome life. My dad is a 30-year Marine. He did Korea one tour, front lines, Vietnam two tours. I always say I have Marine blood. Um, oh, you do. Yeah. <laughs> and, and rhino skin from living in New York City. And so I think the combination of the two, no matter what slings and arrows come, I just have to go toward that white light of my my um, dream life, you know. Oh, but it, but a tender heart and an open spirit. Mm, thank you, thank you. You really, you really do. And what a great place to just be inspired, you know, to <laughs> to see, to be around because you know people in Santa Fe, they're artists, and they're all different yeah. kinds of artists. They're not just. Yes portrait artist, there's every yes. kind of artist conceivable, mm -hmm. so I imagine you can use different people as your muses and and yes. creative exchange. I'm, I've been mm -hmm. watching you and I know that it feeds you. It does. You know, the thing that I, from the beginning of my memory, I always wanted to be around people who play tennis better than I do. Yes. You know, it's people who are more intelligent. But more generous, kinder, more talented, um, and and so it's it's a way of me learning from the greats who um, then help me be greater, help me commit yes. to my exemplary nature. Actually, even today, um, last night I got a wonderful call from probably one of the greatest portrait artists alive today is a friend of mine, his name's David LaFell, and he lives in Taos, which is about an hour and a half away from here me. And he called yesterday and said, do you want to have lunch tomorrow? I miss you. I haven't seen you in a while. And I just, I, I, you know, and, and it's now. So he's right. over at Annapurna having beautiful vegan food and I'm <laughs> with my beautiful Sharon Valentine and grateful. Um, and I just thought when he called, wow. Somehow I have called in mm -hmm. the one of the greatest portrait artists alive today to be my mentor. Nice. And he's so loving and so kind. And if I get stuck in a piece, I'll email him a picture and he'll um, help me move through the stuck. So it's beautiful to have that kind of support and you do attract yeah. that you with your openness. Yeah. In your loving way, you are going to attract those kind of people, and it's just wonderful to watch you do that. I know you have a sense of authorship in you. You know, you write these beautiful spirit mm -hmm. capture letters. You. you have mm -hmm. a lot, and I know that you would like to be an author. Yes. And you know, write other things. Um, yes. What does that look like for you? How does that fit into your into your life of art? Oh, oh beautiful author that you are. Um, uh, what does that look like? The art establishment likes to tell everyone that artists are special people. Mm -hmm. Kind of deify us in a way. Uh -huh. um, some people look at what I do with a sense of awe. And, and I am humbled by that and I'm grateful that they recognize that I do something unique and worthy of 
doing. But I think everyone's an artist. That everyone is a co-creator. I mean, we have billions of cells splitting right now in our bodies, co-creating with spirit, making this life happen, making the world happen. And I feel like if you can draw a, a line, then you, mm-hmm. you you're an artist. Yeah. Okay. If you can if you can speak a word, then you can sing. And I have spent. I went to Parsons School of Design, which was cripplingly critical. And I didn't create for a decade afterwards um, in, in a way that I wanted. I was always creating, mm-hmm. but not in the way that I wanted because I was told that I was no good. And I just think that that's malarkey. So I'd like to create workbooks. And uh, my first book that I see is a combination kind of workbook with spiritual exercises that brought me to... Um, the point of creative freedom that you see behind behind yes. me. Yes. You and I um, took a, a wonderful course, a three-day course called InspiraBook.com, where we were lifted into our authorship, and you went full force and created your book, and it's amazing, <laughs> and I am about a quarter of the way through, so I'm hoping that I get to that. Story. Well, that's one of my favorite stories because you you invited me to that weekend, and mm-hmm. really my motivation was to go and bond with you. I thought, okay, <laughs> yes, got to go to Canada, beautiful. I get to bond with my girlfriend Robbie. We're going to have a great time. Yeah. So I remember we got there, and you looked at me, and you said, Sharon, you you really, this is about creating a book. I said, oh, okay, sure, yes, I have a book. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, fine, I have a book, and out of that weekend. The, the outline for for writing that book came and made it easy. You know, we have to put it in all of the content. So mm-hmm. it, I just love that story. I thought, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, fine. I have a book, and, and then I did it. And I and still amazing, got to bond with you. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I, got everything. I love that. And at some point, you may have to go back with me <laughs> so I can get mine. But it, right, I, exactly. I have watched you create your authorship with such awe. And again, it's you focused and you've done it. You surrounded yourself with people who believe in you and create, support you in creating your book. And you, you, I mean, I remember hearing you working eight, nine hours a day on your book. And And it took a while, didn't it? Yeah. Oh, it took quite quite a process. It was a good process, but you did it with the highest level of integrity. And um, I'm really excited that. to see where, where your book goes. Yes, I am too. I'm excited for it to be um, published, I hope, in the near future. Yes. But, you know, I just want to mention before we move on about, you know, writing the book, and it, it wasn't that I had dreams of being an author because I would never had any intention in my life of being an author, mm-hmm. just not where I saw myself. Mm-hmm. But it was about listening to my internal self and listening, you know, to that yes. internal guidance system. Yes. And something in there was saying, You have a story. You've lived the parenting story. You need to write a parenting book. And I remember going, yeah, no, I don't think so. Uh -uh, No, I'm not (laughs) doing it. I remember saying that for a few years. I remember. That doesn't sound fun. Not doing it. And I remember laughing at you when you would say that because I'm like, all right, she's not there yet. It's not. (laughs) So it was just about having that level of openness and listening like you do that finally I went, well, the universe had to send me to the weekend. Yeah. And, and get it really concrete for me. Sharon, we've made this easy for you. Fill in the blanks. Yes. So it, it's about a willingness to, to step onto our path yeah. and just go with that flow as, mm-hmm. it, as it opens up, right? That really is what takes us to our magical creations. Yes. I like, I like to think of it as the culture of yes. Mm, um, yeah, literally that I am enculturating that. myself with yes because many, 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 many years in my life, all my youth, I, I was the culture of no, no I'm scared, no I can't, no I'm not good enough, no I'm not worthy, no I'm not smart enough, who do I think I am, you know, and mm-hmm. the reality is someone come, I, 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 every year for the new year, instead of make a new year's resolution, I make a new year's theme. And I look at all of my life as kind of a pie chart and say, all right, which facet of my life is not 
supporting me or, or can be stronger. One year it was girlfriends, literally. So I focused entirely on relation, relationship with girlfriends. One was cash flow. One was um, uh, physical well-being. Beautiful. So I pick a theme, and one year I picked the theme, yes. Just say yes. And kind of to whatever someone asks of me. I mean, no, <laughs> knowing that... Mm -hmm. um, Knowing that there are certain things you just shouldn't do, you don't have time, you can't do it in integrity. Or you but don't want to. Yeah. Or you don't want to. Right. But the culture of yes is saying, huh, do I want to go out to coffee with her? Or, you know, and then having a moment of fear, like she's a stranger, which I don't really have anymore, but yes, let's go to coffee with her. She looks interesting. Or, or you know... Sharon calling me and saying, will you do my TV show? Oh, who do I think I am? I, blah, blah. Yes, of course I will do your TV show. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. You know, and believing that if the world is giving me opportunity, mm. then I can say yes to it instead of no. What a great message. That's beautiful. I think everybody can take that and, and fit that into their own lives. Because mm. what does that do, right? It, it causes us to look at what is before us, to mm -hmm. consider it, right? Mm -hmm. to just yes. just the simple act of considering it, which For many me, people it was, don't. It was an opening. It opened yeah. my possibilities, you know, opened me to seeing opportunity. Exactly. Gosh, time goes really fast and we're getting okay. close to being out of time. Robbie, do you have a question for me? Today? I do. I do. Um, okay. So uh, my question for you is, how do you advise one to move past grief when, when one has had a very traumatic loss? I wrote a blog on grief, and it's on my website, and it's how important it is to grieve. It's very important to grieve, and why is it important to grieve? Because when we don't grieve and we have that energy inside of us, it gets stuck. And whenever, I think we all know from our life experience, when energy gets stuck, it causes things that we don't want. You know, pains, disease, over time, things that don't feel good. So it's very important to feel that energy and allow it to move through us and out of us. You know, that's the process of grief, is mm -hmm. truly feeling it, taking whatever has happened to us that is um, our loss and really feeling that. You know, allowing ourselves that process to feel bad, you know, to, mm -hmm. to mourn that thing or that person whatever it is that we're mourning, to take that time to do it. Knowing full well and holding that intention that it is a process and we will move through it and mm. not hold ourselves there because that can happen too, is, is being yeah. held there. You have to, to keep that energy moving and flowing and change your focus mm -hmm. eventually to those things that you know enrich your life and deliberately not hold yourself in that place of grief. That's our personal responsibility. Mm. I love that concept of personal responsibility. Do I have a follow-up question or how's our time? Um, yes, you do. There's time. Thank you. So on, on the head of that, um, so I experienced something, a loss that's very profound and I have a lot of people who know about this and care deeply for me and yet I don't want to talk about it. You know, I mean, people ask me, how are you, and try to offer, you know, condolences or what have you, and um, I am recognizing that I'm pushing people away because I just don't want to deal with their questions. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you advise, what do you advise of me um, to, you know, how do, I, how do I do that with grace? How do I say, okay, truly I don't want to talk about it, and... Thank you for your concern, and let's move on, <laughs> you know? I really can't say it any better than you just said it. I think the breakdown is you not saying that to them. Mm -hmm. See, it's about living your truth, 
living your integrity and mm -hmm. keeping it short and sweet and and you just said it beautifully uh, I can't improve on that really? uh, I'm not ready to talk about it right now I appreciate your love and concern let's talk about something that makes you feel good or let's wow. talk about what we're excited about doing feel yeah. free to change the subject take the responsibility for for picking the fun thing to talk about you've spoken mm -hmm. your truth and your friends and people will respect that and and those if there are any that don't well then you may choose not to be around them because you're being very clear and very honest short and sweet you okay. said it perfectly Robbie you okay. said it perfectly thank you <laughs> is there anything thank you for the great questions really is there anything else you want our viewers to know about how can people find you your your websites and and mm. everything well, my website is RobbieFirestone.com. You can misspell it any way and it'll still come to me. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Which I advise everyone. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And so RobbieFirestone.com, R-O-B-B-I, Firestone, like the tire, dot com. And uh, my Facebook, my Twitter are Robbie Firestone, R-O-B-B-I, Firestone. And um, I have, let's see what's coming up next. New studio. Oh gosh, so much going on. Um, check out my media page on my website. There's a lot, a lot of press right now, which I'm very happy about. It's very you fun. get so much press, and I love that. You <laughs> thank are you. Press rich, you know. Oh, and thank you. Fantastic. You've really, you're very good at business, which I'm sorry mm -hmm. we'll have to save for another show. Yeah. But you really are. You're, you are an artist, but you have mm -hmm. dedicated yourself to being in charge of your life yes. and being a dynamic businesswoman. I am so. fully responsible for feeding myself. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else is going to do it, so I don't wait for the agent or the gallery. I sell myself. And I, I make yeah. sure that um, even if it's hard to do, I do it anyway. Fake it till you make it. That's another big one. Yes. Well, so. you're with integrity. Say it with integrity. <laughs> no, but you do it. You do it beautifully, and you you are you are a deliberate creator. So hmm. it's been, really you. been a joy to have you I've, with me today. Thank you. I love you, and Thank you. Thank I you. hope you'll you come back soon. And I wish you all the luck in the world. And keep us posted on your amazing. I can't wait to hear about your project, your your project of 12 visionaries. Oh, and if anyone wants to contact me with questions about creativity, about mm -hmm. art, about just allowing expressive flow, my, my mission in life is to inspire and empower women to live more co-creative, authentic, joy-filled lives every day. So if there's any of your viewers who want to have a chat, feel free to get in touch with me. And that would be on your website, chat with you sure. there yeah. or Facebook. Yeah. Okay. You can reach All me right. through Facebook, through through my website, Robbie at RobbieFirestone.com. Whatever works. Great. Happy holidays to you, Robbie. Thank you again, and we'll see you soon. Love you. Love you. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much for um, being with us today. We will be back. We'll be off for the holidays for a few weeks, and we'll, we will be back live on January 8th. So enjoy, have fun, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.